um, like to welcome in the wonderful Katie Pierrez, who is um, a patient living with rheumatoid arthritis, a parent, um, talks a lot about um, parenthood and exercise with RA, volunteer with NRAS. Have I missed anything, Katie? You got you wear a lot of hats. <laughs> I don't think you've missed anything, and I can hear my little one uh, knocking on the door. So oh, um, great. We, may, we may get an, an impromptu other guest. <laughs> not a problem. And if at any point you have to go, then of course I'm pleased to say it's not it's not a problem. I know what it's like. I, I started one of these the other week where um, Dylan was having a full blown tantrum outside my door, which um which was a little bit off then. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but welcome in. How are you? No, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Because obviously Brilliant. you've had. Um, um, yeah, a <laughs> lot going on. Yeah, yeah, a lot, lot going on, and it, it's felt like a series of chapters. As soon as I sort of address one issue, another issue pops up. But you know what that um balance and act can be like. <laughs> yeah, and um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us on a Thursday. I really do appreciate it. Um, because I feel like you're one of the people we had on the show that I feel like I know personally the most, but I don't think we've ever actually had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which it feels happens. weird after the last few years, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, and that's that's the beauty of social media um, and all the different platforms that we can now engage with people on. Yeah, so for anyone that doesn't know you as well as I feel like I do, uh, do you want to just give a little introduction about yourself and um, and then we'll get into your sort of diagnosis journey? Yeah, so um, I'm Katie. Um, I've uh, suffered with rheumatoid arthritis for uh, just about 12 years. Yeah, so it's 2011. So I was 28 when I was diagnosed. Um, I'm a mother, work full time and try as much as possible to pa participate in sort of um, exercise and sort of sports. So I run, I've recently completed the Brighton Marathon. I'll say completed, not raced. Um, <laughs> and um, I regularly play netball and sort of try to keep as fit as possible to to kind of, you know, help the overall health. Now that, that gives me a lot of hope. And you, should, you don't take anything away from that achievement to do the marathon because um, as somebody that used to enjoy running a lot and I'm now sort of like in that horrible place where I feel like that might be gone for good, I'm going to be very much... Um, listen intently to what you have to say in the hope that I can try and recapture that. So, um, yeah, good on you for that. Um, yeah, so you mentioned your RA diagnosis. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Like maybe how it onset or how, how, what was that path? We get a very familiar theme on here about that, the length of time between onset and diagnosis. Was, was that a familiar story for you? It is. So I'm not, it didn't take me as long as many people I've heard. Um, but I'd say my onset was quite sort of gradual. So I don't think I sort of realised how bad things were getting. Um, so I guess um, it started in my um, feet and hands. So quite classic RA symptoms. But it was just I was kind of just stiff and suffered with pain just in the morning. So generally by sort of 11 a.m., um, I was generally sort of fine which I know is a word we we don't like using too much but um and what I found was I was really struggling so I was sort of working I'd actually just moved in with my partner at the time um he's now my husband and so it was quite embarrassing because in the mornings I was like a 90 90 year old trying trying to sort of um get ready make a cup of tea um, I live in um, South London, so I commute via sort of train to work. So getting like walking to the train station became problematic. But then every time I would book, say, a GP appointment, that would generally be after work. So I would then go to see my GP, but I couldn't really explain what the problem was because it had gone by that point in the day. So I'd kind of um, the way I try to explain it is I was like the tin man in the morning but I was like a normal sort of 27 year old by the time I went to the GP surgery. So I just sounded like I was a hypochondriac. I went for multiple sort of um, blood tests. So they tested me for like um, low vitamin D, trigger finger, um, all sorts of things, but nobody kind of, um, you know, really got to the bottom of it. And I, I was probably going on a six to eight week sort of basis across a year and I, um, played a lot of tennis when I was younger so I was still sort of playing socially um, at that time and what hit me was the fact that I couldn't beat one of my friends I'd been able to beat at tennis for years right. and I was my wrists were just so weak it really hurt to hit a ball and then I never got the classic big swollen joints but one of my wrists sort of bruised and went brown 
and just looked a bit sort of manky to be you know to be frank um and then finally i found out that my grandma had had ra that that was news to me um and i went in saw a gp said i think i've got ra can you do me a blood test but it took uh, about 12 months and i i yeah just it was just a very horrible journey at that sort of age i mean i know a lot of people watching these sort of diagnoses came much younger um but it was being able to i found it really hard to kind of communicate my symptoms to get them to understand what was actually wrong with me yeah and you're not the first person to say that's amazing you went that long before they'd done some of them tests and everything but i think there's a couple of bits that resonate there with me personally because when i was a kid i kept getting asked do you feel, are you stiff in the morning and i didn't have it then but now right. oh my word in my 30s do i know what they why they were asking because I cannot get going until lunchtime. Yeah. In the afternoon, I'm fine. I can walk dog really long time in the evening, but in the morning, it's horrible. And um, and the same as that swelling. So, like, I don't have RA. I have a different form. But everybody looks for that swelling. And for those of us that don't have that, do you find there's like you're like I can't remember the word you use, but I felt like a fraud. You know, I, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, you you'll go back and you guarantee that one time you see the doctor, you have nothing to show for it, and and it was almost like when i got psoriasis it almost helped like confirm like to show that i had something going on in the inside because of what was on the outside so yeah, yeah. i could really relate to that and, yeah and do you find that had like an impact on your sort of like mentally on on that front because you sort of keep you're going backwards and forwards and didn't really have nothing to show for how it was well you really impacted. start questioning yourself and you kind of think you're going you know that you know there's something wrong with you mentally um, but it's sort of family and friends that were useful because um, my husband was sort of saying, no, you've got to go and get this sorted out. This isn't, you know, this there's something wrong. Um, and it was actually my sister that came to a couple of the sort of final sort of when I first went to the rheumatology department to kind of just help me to because uh, it's hard, I think, when it's going on with yourself and you and I'm sort of someone that will naturally just say oh no there's nothing wrong I'm okay but it was really helpful for somebody else to kind of go along and sort of talk on my behalf in a way um to sort of explain exactly um what they're seeing the differences are because you sometimes yeah. as well I don't think you realize it in yourself because it's so gradual and I went on um a big sort of thing that really flagged there was a definite problem I went on a really brilliant holiday one of my friends was getting married in Australia so we went to Perth oh, nice. but the heat just every, that is when I did have swelling every, like I had sausage fingers for pretty much the whole time I was there um, and I just that holiday it was meant to be like this really exciting time and it was but then it was also horrible at the same time so it you know it's got a funny memory in my mind <laughs> yeah and, and the thing is it's weird because you only need, you'll have them things that trigger i know i do anyway like you'll then associate like those sort of memories don't you with with other things so like um for me i've got a flare in my hip at the moment so that harps back to my first ever flare in my hip and I, i'm guessing like with you and the heat thing you 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 hold on to that don't you and you yes. you you associate it with it and it affects your sort of planning and everything and it makes you a little bit fearful um yep. of sort of certain sort of situations holidays i love the sun yep. but i wouldn't really want to go anywhere super hot again because i kind of know how you know that could affect me yeah and there is a big difference between sun and heat like i always said to people like my my arthritis my skin if he loves the sun but that out and out heat causes its own issues yeah. doesn't it yeah um, so okay, so so you, you got you went through that period, and then how did that next stage look like for you in terms of finding what worked for it to get managed? Was there a bit of a gap between it getting managed or, or what you would consider managed? I know everyone's got a different view of what what that controlled arthritis looks like, but or so, is that still an ongoing process? Um, so I think so. I think it kind of got managed relatively quickly, um, but actually, when I look back and then realize how it was then managed maybe five years later it maybe wasn't managed as well as i thought it was at the time so i mm -hmm. so i think so i i, I had the, the the kind of stereotypical sort of um methotrexate um hydroxychloroquine sulfasalazine um and 
I'd say methotrexate worked quite quickly. So within four months, I did see quite a big improvement. Um, and I was able to kind of start doing things again that I wanted to do. Uh, but then obviously, there's also uh, sort of the effects of having been kind of like inactive for a certain amount of time, yes. putting on weight, things like that, all, all kind of just builds kind of challenges, whether it's mentally, physically, everything like that. So I'd say sort of four months, it was relatively well managed. Uh, but there was still a lot of pain. There's a lot of things I still couldn't do. Um, and probably within a year, I'd managed to get um, the sort of doses right of those three drugs that I was taking at that point. And, and you made a really good point in there about like how it can feel like a mountain because people focus on the pain or they focus on the treatment but it's all the stuff the baggage that comes with that so like as somebody that puts on a lot of weight when i flare because i'm so used to being really sporty it's really difficult then isn't it because it's like okay the, the medicine might be working and your pain might be low but you're still facing these massive barriers whether that's like repairing social life or yeah. getting fit again like do you do you find that a challenge yeah and no, because i think it that impacts you just as much as the disease um because you kind of need to feel uh, confident to then do certain things i think so it, it's and and this is something i've always had a slight issue with is the fact that when you're diagnosed and and i get like there's time involved in in those um uh, appointments but everything's so focused on getting your disease score down it's not always focused on what do you want? Like there's no kind of goal setting. Achieve. I know there's lots of talks about this in pathways and things that should be happening, but in the reality of it, it's not happening. Um, and it all, always, you know, because you, I always have a bit of a, if I had had those conversations earlier on, what could I be doing now? And and the thing is, just trying to get people to think, in my opinion, this, I'm not saying this is yours, but in my opinion as well, it's getting people to see that that's like reaping what you sow down the road as well. Because I always think if I was more informed and involved and educated and people ask me what I, you know, what a successful outcome was to me when I was younger, then I might not be such a problem now as an adult because, you know, it's that managing expectations and learn how you can help yourself. And, and no one talked to me about triggers and, you know, and all they just kept saying is move more, move more, take your painkillers, move more. And it's just like, it didn't tell me the why or what we were trying to achieve with all of that. And, um, and in an age where we're getting to see our doctors less and less it, I don't know, I, I, I'm really worried about what that looks like because you and I had those experiences say 10 years ago, Yeah. whatever it must be like for new patients today. It, it, I try not to think about it too much because I don't think I'd ever sleep, but, <laughs> but yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. And it, it's just sort of the, the whole uh, access to physios even that yeah. you kind of have to beg <laughs> yes and and now that now you've got these roles like um they have where i am anyway where they'll have like a triage in your gp it feels like you have to go through so many hoops to get to the specialist physiotherapy that used to be just like a given 10 15 years yeah. ago didn't it you know you'd be you'd get your treatment plan and you'd get your physio and they kind of went hand in hand now it just feels so disparate and you know not joined up that's just yeah 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 <laughs> and and things that you experience throughout your kind of journey you've always got something different that comes into play yeah and i suppose that brings us on nicely into starting like a family because like talking about those you know acceptable outcomes and treatment goals and things like that that changes doesn't it through yes. through your sort of yeah. life journey with arthritis how did that what this is quite a big question but how did that play a part in like you know if you're starting a family and did it was was your treatment presumably affected you've mentioned things like methotrexate and that do you want yep. to tell us a little bit about how that how that worked out yeah yeah so i remember when i got diagnosed i went for my second appointment to start the medication so i was 28 so kind of i guess prime fertile stage of my life um and the rheumatologist that i was seeing um said do you want a family and i was like i was with with my husband he wasn't my husband yet and we both sort of looked at each other we hadn't had this conversation we just moved in with each other 
Um, so we were like, yes, but not now. So right, bang, you get me to Trexate. Um, and sort of told to keep sort of having those conversations. And at that point, obviously guidelines always change. You had to be off me to Trexate for about six months um, before looking to, to start a family. Um, so it was about, so my kind of main priority to begin with was sort of getting my um, disease under control and sort of feeling like I was in a, you know, a good position because also, you know, if you're feeling a bit fat, a bit, you can't move, you don't really want to have sex either. So there's all those kind of things that are, you know, part of that, that whole, whole kind of, you know, uh, helping the whole person. So it was about three years later. So I, must, I was about 31. Um, I started having those conversations that we, that we were thinking about um, starting a family. So I was very lucky because I had a really, really brilliant nurse at the time. Unfortunately, she's not in, in the department anymore, but she really, really helped me because um, at the time to start biologics, you had to be on methotrexate. Um, so what she did was she put me, um, she did all the sort of funding, did all the tests to kind of get me through to, and obviously your disease activity has to be a certain, um, had to be a certain uh, score at the time. That's thankfully for lots of patients now that's been lowered. Um, but she slightly, she just said to me, say ow a few more times when I touch your knuckles and then you'll qualify. <laughs> I know I can relate to that as somebody who had to get that three or more active areas and I didn't have inflamed joints. And, and it depends on the day, doesn't it? Yeah, so, it totally does. You know, it's and, so silly. Is, and when they do x-rays, which only show like damage rather than active, and I convinced them to send me for like an ultrasound and I was crying when the guy says, oh, your hands look all right. And I, was, I cried. He asked me why I was crying. And I said, because I desperate, I desperately need you to find something because I'm in so much pain. And he found it in two places, hadn't found it in the third. And um, he told me he'd only found it in the two. And then it magically all went through. So I don't know what happened there, but something, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. sometimes you need that person advocating for you. You can yes. see that you're in real difficulty, but you just don't tick all the boxes, do you? Yeah. Yeah. And so she got me onto uh, my first biologic and that biologic at the time, um, you could be pregnant up until sort of 32 weeks on it okay. or something. Um, and but actually, there's a story before that. Um, I was uh, doing something for NRAS and I was talking about all my problems. And my consultant at the time had actually been saying I couldn't be on a biologic. Um, or this might have been later. Timeline's gone a bit yeah, fuzzy I know, in my I head. Know how that feels. <laughs> um, and luckily, one of their like chief medical officers wrote a letter for my to my rheumatology team saying actually if you look at the research this is what a patient is allowed in this situation oh. so it you know it, it, a lot of this stuff I think comes down to kind of luck as well a little yeah. bit as in who who you've got in your team who you know and who can kind of help you at the time yeah, um, does. and as someone who's done a bit of travel and meeting other people from other countries as well like I used to moan a lot about those bent, those, those holes we had to jump through. But then when you see how many countries there are where they're not even available, it's like it was such an eye opener for me last year. I don't, I can't even imagine existing without biologics today. So, um, so yeah, it's frustrating yeah, trying so, to get access. Yeah, so biologics basically that's when once I've been on biologics, I realised actually on the other drugs I wasn't that well. Yes, sort of thing. Yeah. I, I thought I was a lot better and I thought I was doing really well. The nurses, the consultants told me I was. And then, but when I went on biologics, I was like, oh, so there was like little nodules and things that kind of then kind of disappeared. Um, and and for me, they've been the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, exact same experience. I thought I was well managed on me. Well, me for Trexate ruined my liver like it does for a lot of people or got a little bit dangerous and had to come off it. And then you go on biological, like you said, you suddenly, oh, okay. So this is, and again, it goes back to educating people, doesn't it? And letting people know what, what the, um, you know, kind of setting expectations and, and what, you know, because if you don't know, you don't need to ask and demand for more, do you, unfortunately? 
And also at the time, I couldn't really. So when you're in the waiting room, sorry, I've gone completely off off topic. But when you're, you're in fine. the waiting room, you don't see people that look like you. Yes. Generally, <laughs> I mean, soon I'll be in this camp. But generally, I'm so the same, yeah. generally you <laughs> see all silver silver surf, surfers in the in the waiting room, and you feel a bit weird because you can. I always used to. It's probably just more me, but I felt like everybody was looking at me like, "Why are you in this department?" Mm. And I quite often would get asked, like I was a consultant or a, I don't know, people would say, oh, where's this? And I was like, I'm a patient, thanks. Yeah, I used to get asked, we, um, um, were my parents in with a consultant, which is horrible. I'm sitting there, you know, what I mean? because they, they, their assumptions get made, don't they? Um, but I would just go back to that bit you said about having a nurse that was championing you, because I'm, I'm the same. I had an amazing biologist nurse. She's disappeared now during pandemic and everything. And I think about her a lot. And because if it wasn't for her... I don't know about you, but like rheumatologists, for all of their expertise and that, they are terrible at that family planning conversation. Yeah. You know, I'm a male and it's not as it wasn't as serious for me. I'd still have to stop my move track tape, but I had no issues with biologics. Turned out self salazine was stopping us starting a family. But those conversations, um, they're so dry and poorly delivered. And if it wasn't for my biologics nurse, I wouldn't have felt like anyone understood the impact that my disease and my treatment was having on starting a family. And, and again, going back to what we were saying earlier, that really worries me that that issue with access to those at the moment and that personalized sort of like they know you, don't they? Um, I don't know. It just worries me. How do you think in the old model before nurses and everything, when it was just the rheumatology, I can't even imagine. I think that would be awful. Um, and right now the difficulty is, so I used to have a, I'll, I had a really good actual rheumatologist that she probably looked after me for my first three years. Um, and then when I went down the sort of biologics route, then my biologics nurse was brilliant. So those two, I had a really positive first sort of three to four um, years from diagnosis because I had two people that knew me really, really well. But since then, so the last sort of nine, eight, nine years, basically every time I go I've got a different whether it's a different nurse a different rheumatologist I don't really I sometimes don't know if I'm seeing the nurse or the rheumatologist so I you just don't have any rapport they don't know who I am and then I'm you're going through your, half of the um, appointment is talking about the things that you've talked about a million times before and you kind of get a bit bored of yourself I don't know if you find that you kind yeah. of like yeah. I've said this so many times. And you've it, clearly only read the first page on the note. Yes. <laughs> let's, yeah, you let's, don't... let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that it, it, it bothers me because the, the bit that bothers me maybe like wearing my advocate hat on, which maybe isn't so <laughs> obvious to to the to, to any sort of just patients watching this, is that like we know in in England, NHS England, everything that patient initiated follow up thing is coming, you know. But it annoys me that it feels like that's already started, you know. That that lack of personalization, that who shouts the loudest will get brought back into the system. You know, we shouldn't be moving away from that regular appointment, regular checkup, designated biologic nurse model yet. But in my experience, that's that's already that's long. Gone already. Yeah, it's gone already. And 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 it was so um ironic that i got an email today asking to fill out a survey about patient shared follow-up so i'm thinking practically doing this already i'm already out of the door as an old hat um you yeah. know treated and diagnosed arthritis patient and and sometimes really you don't me. know yourself maybe if you're going having issues and i'm i'll hold my ha hand up i'm not very good at remembering to go for my blood tests mm -hmm. um so if i'm not going for blood tests and i'm not getting follow-ups then they don't know how I'm doing. No, no. And uh, mine's a perfect example of that in that, you know, I was recently neutropenic and my last blood test was in January, but I'd gone to the doctors three or four times for antibiotics, for infections, and nobody thought to do a blood test earlier. And and it's that sort of stuff that just really yeah. bothers I know I'm going way off topic here, Katie. No, getting, no, no, it's fine. I, I, I always like to think about <laughs> Doris that lives in the village. Yeah. <laughs> that just doesn't think about this. Yeah. Sorry if anybody's called Doris watching. Um, <laughs> who just doesn't think about any of this stuff. No, and isn't, and isn't educated. Charge. Yeah. Yeah, it shouldn't be down to us. And the trouble is, 
we haven't addressed the educating the patient issue now. So how we're ready to go down a patient initiated follow up pathway when patients don't know when to ask for help. And also there's some like me, I'm a hypocrite when I talk about my advocacy because I'm terrible for asking for help. You know, the amount of people that will be on my Twitter feed or whatever telling me, oh, Joel, you've got to ring this person. You've got to do that. And, and I'll tell other people to do it, but I haven't always got the energy or the fight in me to, to do it myself or I worry about bothering people when there's worse off and this sort of thing. So I think if we haven't got the educated, informed patient bit sorted yet, why we're just leaving people out anyway we've gone well I've gone we've way off it. subject katie but it's nice to know somebody i could else rant does. i could rant about this sort of thing all day <laughs> yeah yeah so um because like i say you're jumping from one thing to another you need to do the work in the middle first that's that's my takeaway um but it's nice to know you had that biologic nurse experience and again it goes back to the earlier point that we said where if you're a new patient tomorrow that just it just bothers me and i'd like to do more about that and i don't know how so if anyone's watching this who who knows how i could help make more noise about that then 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 please get involved um so if we fast forward a little bit so you, you i'm assuming everything went well with starting a family and, and your little one and everything and and then how did you adjust to that period did it cause more problems for your arthritis how was your disease during that them early years so not brilliant because at the time i had to come off um, biologics I was really really lucky that I know many people will experience this but not everybody that pregnancy um, my RA kind of went away uh, but whether it was the pregnancy whether it was the fact I was on biologics for the most of most of my pregnancy I don't know um, but 32 weeks pregnant had to come off um, biologics I took sulfur salazine I think all the way through from memory mm -hmm. um, but then what you find is it comes back with an vengeance but mine was actually similar to when i when it first sort of um came on because it was kind of quite a gradual sort of onset of i i suffer predominantly in my sort of um hands wrists um ankles and feet and but the issue you've got with uh, being a new parent is all the equipment is not friendly to really painful wrists or um you know everything's like heavy we we tried to combat that by looking at kind of light prams but i don't think there's really a light pram if i was going to be have a baby now i'd probably buy a yo-yo um so that you know it's just having that understanding of what equipment is there i i was thankful actually that i breastfed for quite a long time because that really sort of helped some people will struggle with some of the positions but you're not having to faff with sort of bottles so it, it's you know working out whatever works best for you essentially um but no it was horrible and i knew i'd done a bit of research and i knew there was a biologic that you can take throughout pregnancy throughout breastfeeding so because i was breastfeeding i couldn't go back onto my biologic we'd made a plan that um I'd only breastfeed for six months so I could go back on it but my son had very different ideas about that and didn't like a bottle so I did a bit of research I sort of advocated for myself got an appointment with the head rheumatologist at my hospital he was horrible and he just said well why should we bother you're just going to have another baby and I was like well this <laughs> this <laughs> and you know you're quite you know my son was about nine months you're quite hormonal yeah. You know, you're, still, <laughs> you're not you're sleeping. On no and... sleep, <laughs> on no sleep, not in a good place in any capacity. Joints hurt, can't pick up anything. Like, go and see somebody who you think might have a solution because you've done yeah. a bit of your own research. And um, he just said, nah, you can't, That's not going to do that for you. So you're, you're triggering a lot of my um, little. <laughs> bugbears Kate <laughs> experience <laughs> so so I, I'd been going and having like um a load of steroid injections like I was constantly going for a steroid injection because everything was just not happy and it's like why am I like you should have given me this drug in the first place in my opinion yeah. but it's obviously not a drug that you know your department sign up to or you know you've probably not got a great you know, you might not go to golf with your pharmaceutical company selling it. I don't know. I'm uh, <laughs> digressing. <laughs> but eventually, I don't know what I did. So people would probably want to know what I did, but I can't remember. I think I just kept on calling, emailing, um, 
and being quite annoying until they gave me that biologic. So persistence was definitely key. And a lot of um, pregnant female, post-pregnant female tired hormones and just cried at this, like this 60 year old man <laughs> until he'd give me the medication that I wanted. But I know a lot of people would go, they'd be told no, and then they'd just go home and be in loads and loads of pain. So it just, I found it the most, it, this was, this is actually the most frustrated I was ever in the whole time. Because they, they were just saying, well, well, tell your son not to breastfeed. And I was like, well. <laughs> and it goes back to that being that unrelatable thing again, doesn't it? You talked about the waiting room and then you, you've got a 60 year old man trying to, you know, give you terrible parental advice. And yes, really, really yeah. you want solutions, not, not just things are going to just cause you more heartache. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, that's just yeah, just a random. Sorry, sorry a you rant, had that. But... No, no, I'm sorry you had that experience. You, you're just fueling me now. <laughs> so you just get get uh, get campaigning. So that's something <laughs> I would like to see. So really, when a female or and and men, when if you're in a age range where you might want to have children, I think from the off, it where, where it's possible, they should be putting you onto sort of medications that means your medication is not going to be interrupted because, in, and you know, there's new new things, new research coming out all the time. So things change sort of rapidly. So I don't think there's any reason for people to suffer. No. And, and, and also it's like, what it bothers me when people get given me for Trexate or whatever, because there's also such a big stigma around that. And you only have to spend 10 minutes on Instagram to see people just want to race to biologics because of, they don't understand, like people like me and you, Meath Trex, they worked really well. And it worked really well for me for a lot of years. It didn't end great, but there's also downsides to biologics and, yeah. and everything else. And I think the trouble is when you're giving people something strong like this, and then you're also in the same breath saying about don't start a family or don't do this. Don't, I don't know. It's just you could package that so much better than yeah. than, than I feel that they do. And they, it doesn't help themselves. And then if people don't understand the risks, don't understand what you're trying to achieve with the drug, then of course they're not going to stick with it and they're going to try and jump forward to other yeah. options. And yeah. Yeah. And it's like, sorry, something else. I was, as soon as I was diagnosed, I was put straight on the pill Yeah. and I, it doesn't agree with me. The hormones have never, you know, I have to use other forms of contraception and it, that again I was just told if you're going on methotrexate you have to go on contraception um and there was no discussion and because I guess you're kind of in that I think as patients especially when you're newly diagnosed you feel on like you're on the back foot so you will do kind of what you're told if you've got my sort of personality until I sort of was more educated I never said anything back so it's just that delivery and making sure people understand um it's getting the healthcare system to understand people if that makes yeah. sense if that yeah. makes any sense yeah no it really does <laughs> somebody's been on receiving end of a lot of those conversations <laughs> yeah that human and i think that's where the biologics nurses are so awesome you know they like for me anyway my experience was they understood me they knew what i wanted yeah. to do what was going on in my life and how it had changed and what my personal benchmarks were and yeah. and i feel like we're lo we lost that a lot since yeah. the pandemic or in my personal experience yeah so i once said to my consultant i want to be able to do a cartwheel again yeah <laughs> and they, i mean you know maybe i'm not bothered now but when i was younger i did and they just laughed at me and, it, and you know it is sort of funny but it was more about having the wrist strength and the arm strength yeah. so yeah. you know it's just little things like that that kind of sometimes just get laughed at and pushed to to one side and yeah. that because my consultants come back with well i can't do that and i was like well hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and there's also the other side of it like i, I went for a phase where a doctor would always say to me like that the opening gamble would always be how's the rugby going or how's the hockey go? And I'd been able to do it for ages and I was heartbroken about it. And like, wow. it was almost like, you know, when your mate would say, they'd ask you to do something in the hope that I'd magically help you run it off or what. And it's kind of yeah. what that conversation felt like every time, like, like a parent saying to your, um, Oh, is your homework done? Like when you know full well, it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> and just yeah. for saying that you're demoralizing me from minute one. And um, yeah, that, you know, we need to find a way of them, of, building them bridges where people understand their patient more than what the test results say or more than what 
yeah. the treatment says. Oh, How Kate, you you've that? triggered How me on so that? many. <laughs> you've triggered me on so many things tonight. I feel like I feel like I'm going to sort of come off here and ring you up. And we're going to start a yeah. campaign on something to fix some of this. But um, I, I'm conscious of your time. Um, so if we just fast forward a little bit in that, um. How did you, so, you know, those early years of kids is tough and everything. You've talked about how exercise has helped you and keep moving. And you obviously were really sporty before the arthritis yeah. and everything. How have you balanced that? Because I know it's something I've failed at numerous times on and off. How, how have you balanced living with a condition like arthritis, um, parent, and, and just yeah having the energy and time to do it all? I think it's really, really tricky. And I have to say there's one good thing that's come out of COVID is for I know not everybody can but being able to work from home a lot more than previously has kind of given me an extra two hours a day essentially um so I'd normally commute an hour in the morning an hour in the evening so that's where I think that's given me back a little bit of time which is when I will try and do things for myself um so I I jog and I um I play for a local netball team play quite badly for a local netball team but still play for a local netball team (laughs) just for more the sort of social aspect so I'm quite a sort of sociable outgoing person so I do you know I I quite like that sort of element of sport um but I've all I think one of the things is I've always been sporty so it's not like I suddenly decided to become sporty once I was diagnosed I'd already been doing um lots of different things um and it sort of the diagnosis made me more determined so i'm not sure i'd still be doing as much sport if i didn't have the diagnosis because i think obviously life can get in uh, like work kids family lots of things can kind of get in the way of um your kind of time in that side but i think because part of my body isn't that healthy i want to try and kind of combat that as much as possible don't know if that really answers the question but yeah no no I was gonna I was gonna say like as as, um as somebody that's sort of like you talked about you know almost being more motivated or you know your condition you're sort of more determined as somebody who's had their fair share of setbacks where like you know I tend to be a bit boom and bust when I'm really well controlled I'll do ridiculous sports I probably shouldn't be doing and then I suffer and get really depressed and mentally affected when I can't and I lose that social circle element how do you keep pushing through that i need to know that personally because i've failed numerous times but how do you sort of sustain that motivation when you have all the setbacks that our our disease can present yeah so i've definitely done the sort of boom and bust thing so as an example i entered the london marathon the year so i did the london marathon the year after i was diagnosed and i was in the um opening ceremony for the olympics like that okay. was just stupid but so i spent a lot of days crying either <laughs> running crying or at some stupid rehearsal crying because i felt horrendous so so i think it's been a lot of trial and error in terms of doing too much so it it's really hard because it's so personal to each person yeah you've got to sort of work it out so you've got to i think you have got to make the mistakes of the the boom and bust stuff to then figure out what works for you so i i have to make sure i have rest days where i pretty much do nothing um to sort of counterbalance um it's obviously like there's the the spoon theory and i think i think about it across a week rather than a day yeah so it, it's just building in that time i think i'm very lucky because i've got a very good husband who picks up a lot of like the childcare runs and you know yeah. all the different things as well. So it, it's just finding that balance and hopefully having that kind of support network around you that can just help when needed. I think that support network is crucial. And we talk a lot about on here about how that can take many forms. I think when when you say support network, people often think, well, just like immediately those around you in the house, but that that could be anything, you know, and and that's one of the reasons why we create the peer support space as we do for people that maybe need that that extra from people that maybe don't understand who are around them. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I think they're really good points there. And, and, and one, another way someone explained it to me is that sort of like flattening the curve because we're like a boom and bust. You can yeah. you feel good. So you can go and get a load of stuff done today, but that feeling good will only last for a day. Or you can sort of dilute those activities and maybe make that that good period last three or four days. Yeah. And I, I try and remind I still fail at it occasionally, but I try and remind myself. But um and, and I suppose you adapted as well, didn't you? Like, you know, if your hands and wrists, feet are affected, then yeah. maybe netball is a bit easier than tennis. And... Yeah, so I can't play tennis anymore. It's too painful. So that decision was made for me. Um, I battled attempting to play for a, a good two or three years, but and also dan I used to do a lot of dancing, but again, you don't wear supportive shoes. It, so I did a lot of sort of jazz type stuff so it'd be mainly kind of barefoot and the amount of times my feet would just be crunching and like age I probably wouldn't have been dancing anyway because of age but um yeah you just have to adapt and find the activities that work for for you essentially yeah and it, and it hurts emotionally like I, I it's okay to talk about it like for people and you want to watch this like i talk about it a lot as being like a grief cycle and it is you know when them, when them decisions are made for you you know there's something about being able to quit something on your own terms and then when you you can't have the choice like i know full well you know i'm as i'm fast approaching 40 i probably wouldn't still be playing rugby now but i'd still like to have decided when yeah i couldn't play and and there's that element of it so it's good that you've replaced it i think i feel like i've replaced mine with advocacy i still need to try and like get back out to being sporty because I'm like you're a very sporty person but do you find like for me what holds me back a lot is benchmarking like I'm conscious that if I go to the gym tomorrow I'm going to remember what I used to be able to lift compared to what I could do now etc etc et so I do stuff. that all the time so um even just my 5k running time I still know what I could do before and I'm way 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 off it and something I would say I absolutely love is park run because mm -hmm. and now it's not just about running either it's about um so i'll quite often volunteer and be like the tail walker or i'll be the run one minute walk one min minute volunteer so they've got it, it it's kind of a real nice sort of way of bringing people together to exercise but it's not about kind of performance it's more about just being there and doing it so that's one thing i would say if people have got one locally it's it's a brilliant sort of you know you've got people out with their dogs people pushing their kids in prams um that sort of thing i think is great um if if you you know you like running or walking not everybody does yeah, I, I used to love running just for the um headspace i found for me it was just yeah. it gave me time to process stuff and i don't get that space now i'm sure my long-suffering wife notices <laughs> that as well because like you say you work from home don't you you get you work from home and you go downstairs in my case and you're straight with your family hat on and and not having that sort of like i think that's where i take i have the biggest miss from not doing the exercises the, the mental side of it yes yeah no and and running for me is very much i've never been able to meditate but i think running for me is a bit like meditation because i yeah. completely don't think about anything yeah, or, or, or worry about making sure you get home. Yeah, like yeah. I'd, always, I'd always make sure that I went a little bit further than I was comfortable with because it'd give me something to focus on. Well, I know. So when I did my first marathon, there was many times when I was calling my husband saying, can you pick me up? I'm, I can't get home. Everything hurts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've had my fair shares of being collected. Mine was when I was cycling. I'd go out and stupidly think I could cycle 60 miles or something without any real prep. And my wife would have to bring out lots of sugar and <laughs> supplies. I'd sit on the side of the road for half an hour and then sort of fumble back. <laughs> but I don't think we'll ever get rid of that. So I think for anyone, like, and I was diagnosed really young, but I think for anyone that has had a previous life prior i think and and like you, you get good remission periods you know i had a few in my 20s and 30s where they were real like i basically felt normal for one for a better word and then it is hard not to compare to that isn't it and benchmark and no definitely yeah go too hard on it so um yeah it's a cycle of grief guys and you're not alone if you feel that way occasionally but it's, it's nice to hear people that are um that are still doing positive things and you're certainly inspiring me to get off my backside more because i think i think there has definitely been times i don't know about you where i've used my disease almost as like that excuse because i'm fearful of how much is going to hurt or what the repercussions are going to be like that it's easier sometimes to i don't know go into ostrich mode and not try anything rather than 
try something just at a lower level or a lower lower impact yeah so I really really struggled when I was first diagnosed so I did used to go to the gym quite a lot I don't really do that now because time in time problems but I'd go to a lot of classes and I felt really really embarrassed at the start of a class saying I can't do that because of my wrists or mm. so I'd try and do things that I shouldn't be doing so it, it it's really I think it's such a it's really hard um because I didn't want to tell a teacher that I'd got arthritis because inevitably someone will go oh yeah my granny she's got problems with her wrist <laughs> <laughs> oh I thought only old people got that that's yeah. a classic one. but I think that's that like disability adjustment isn't it and once you start accepting it then suddenly asking for help gets a lot yep. easier as well and I'm, I'm still going through that cycle but I know lots of people who tell me that who are out the other side of that sort of journey um finds it a lot easier to then ask for accommodations that maybe you wouldn't have done before yeah yeah i think um, age helps <laughs> so yeah yeah definitely and i think yeah when i was in my 20s i could push through and suffer the consequences a bit more now i can't and i've got little people that depend on me as, as yeah. you do and and i think that comes into the thinking as well doesn't it yeah definitely. um I'm conscious to ask you quickly before you go, as we sort of, um, we're, we're sort of, this time's flown by, Kate. I feel like we could talk about lots of subjects tonight and still be here till midnight. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about what got you into sort of volunteering. Obviously, you do lots of awesome stuff for NRAS, um, for anyone who doesn't wear a half rights charity here in the UK. Um, yeah, what, what got you into that? And then maybe tell us a little bit about what you do for NRAS. Um, so I can't honestly remember, but I do remember sort of doing a sort of, they were asking um, for people to help with their first um, RA Awareness Week. I think that was maybe in like 2013 or something. Um, so I sort of volunteered for that, had no idea what I was doing, had no no clue about the charity. Um, and then it sort of evolved from there. I think I kind of wanted to find more people that I could relate to, which is always a struggle, but um, I'll get onto that in a minute. Um, but in terms of sort of volunteering, it kind of evolved from kind of helping out with different kind of whether it was videos, speaking at um, events, sort of telling my story. Um, and then um, I sort of helped out with their, they've got a peer to peer um, support line. So anyone that's newly diagnosed that wants to talk to somebody um, that's been through something similar to them so I quite often will um, uh, sort of speak to sort of people of a, a similar age or people diagnosed at a similar age people looking to start a family or people that want to get back into sort of exercise so I do those sort of on and off and then then I volunteered they were setting up a face-to-face -face support group so I live um, sort of South London's the closest one is Croydon so I became one of their group um leaders uh for the Croydon area so anyone in the Croydon area big <laughs> potential come along to some of the meetings we have kind of like different people speaking very haphazardly um take uh, happen now because I'm the only volunteer running it um and then in lockdown I tried to transfer those meetings to sort of zoom but the the general audience that attend didn't really like um sort of digital interaction so then I worked with NRAS to set up um we've set up the join together digital um groups the one I'm most involved with is exercise and back to sports we have lots of different sort of speakers from sort of physios to fatigue lecturers um all different people to try and and the idea is to try and inspire people back into exercise or sport or for those that are already participating to kind of talk around um the challenges that they face and and how they get over them so similar to what what we've spoken about today um, and then we've also got one for parenting people that are, uh, have um, inflammatory arthritis and are a parent and equally for parents of children um uh, with jia and and sort of um similar conditions and then there's also one for people working um so quite busy uh, but I'd say yeah. it was funny how you fall into this whole thing. Yeah. Well, so. <laughs> and then it was sort of in um, lockdown. I got furloughed, obviously, also was um, completely forgotten the word where we all had to stay inside because of our oh, condition. Shielding. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> that and and I and I I kind of turned to social media and it's amazing. I didn't know so shielding essentially kind of I kind of didn't realise I guess how serious the drugs and things were that we're all on. Um and I knew that a lot of the drugs would um sort of inhibit your immune system, but for me I've never really had too many problems in that area. Um, so I was just quite shocked, to be honest, that I was in a higher sever severity category to my mum. So <laughs> you know, who knew? Uh, I actually am 96. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know what the question was, but <laughs> I've gone off on a complete <laughs> undone. No, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> but I think that is that, like, um, that, that bringing people together. There is so much to be said for that. Like I, I was somebody that I went most of my life not talking about my arthritis. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I didn't want to be um judged my sport and ability based on that or you know the whole you did well considering kind of thing. And then like you say that lockdown happened and suddenly people felt comfortable sharing that stuff because yeah. it became a topic and it almost became a group people weren't ashamed to be part of. And around the same time I'd start talking about my experiences. And yeah, it was really powerful, wasn't it? I know, it, I know, we didn't sustain that, and a, a lots of people have since gone back to to the place where I was, and I, I got I respect that because I was there. Um, but I think the conversations we did have, and what has then gone on to continue, like the work that you're doing, the stuff that we're doing here, um, yeah, it, it felt really special out of a really yeah. difficult time yeah. for people, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really, it really changed my mindset, and it did make me realise how many people were in similar sort of uh, stages in their life to me um because my son was like two at the time so it was really hard to be honest shielding with a two-year-old um and I didn't totally shield we did go out for like one family walk a week and I did one run a week yeah. otherwise I would have really really struggled so I think you just had to find ways for you to kind of cope depending on I guess your own you know situa situation and circumstances yeah no so um is there anything you want because you you obviously do the exercise activity um where can people find that if, they, if they've listened to you tonight and felt inspired and motivated um is it where can people find that or more information on that so if you go to um the nras website and look up their join together groups um, you'll find the email address. So actually the easiest way is um, I am joined together at nras.org.uk um, and then I can direct people if they wanted to attend any of those groups. And the exercise and back to sport group, we've got our next meeting um, on Zoom on the 18th of May. Um, so if anyone's interested, just email me and I can send um, a registration link. And we're having a talk from a gentleman at Key Active, which is basically like a bit of a sort of um, exercise social prescribing um, organisation. Um, so that should be quite interesting because I, I keep hearing a lot about social prescribing, but I don't really know what it is. So my, I didn't discover it until two years ago and it's absolutely blown my mind and changed massive yeah so i'm quite in, i'm really intrigued by it so actually if you have yeah. any talks on here around it i'd love i'd, I'd yeah no, i haven't been able to get anyone on to yeah, come and share okay. their only my person but yeah like when i i didn't realize there was things like you know um employment support and you know getting active and and all these sort of things and, and mine will come up from shielding you know i didn't realize these people were available that could get you access to stuff if and and it's basically thinking outside that that treatment you know bubble. yeah that's, yeah, that's so I think thing. we're all so um, medicated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's hot topic at the minute. Yeah. But it, it's kind of like there's other methods of medication, but they don't come through all the time. Yeah, it's, a, it's like you say, that well-being, mental health support, the talk and therapies, the employment services, the financial services. It's amazing, amazing. And I found pain talking management. therapies is brilliant. We've had yes. them talk at our Croydon group. Yeah. loads so they're always I've, my they're my go-to when i can't find anybody <laughs> that's it and i've i've i've, I've self-referred for cbt three summers in a row since um the pandemic and that is purely because every summer i see a load of 
Facebook pictures of my mates getting back together for pre-season, it right. properly rocks me. And that now I know it's going to come. I actually prepare for it, but I would have had no idea how to access any of that if it wasn't for social prescribing. So again, anyone watching this that wants to come on, who's got experience of delivering those sort of services, that'd be awesome. Because there are so many people here in the UK that don't know any of those services exist. And they're, they're an absolute goldmine um, for helping people outside the box. I think that's probably the, the holistic yeah. sort of approach. Yeah. <laughs> right. I feel like we should wrap this up, Kate, because I do. I, we I'm tried sorry, to do I didn't these, notice the time. <laughs> no, you're fine. I'm worried more about you. You're the guest here. But like I always say, these conversations should be like a coffee shop discussion. And I've never felt one more so than tonight. Like I feel like we could have just gone off on 101 tangents. We clearly um got lots of similar experiences and views and everything. So um, I will put anyone who's watching this back or listening to this back i'll put any links to what katie's mentioned tonight um in the show notes do i just give a quick mention where people can find you on social media katie very good point so i'm at joint dot adventure on um link uh, not linkedin on <laughs> instagram <laughs> there you go i am 96 um and on twitter i'm very simple katie pieris and linkedin pretty much the same Someone has actually said in chat, Kate is actually Doris. I know, I saw that. Oh, you did say that. <laughs> I started chuckling to myself. I'm actually talking about myself when I talk about Doris. Yeah. <laughs> I say I do worry when we talk about our arthritis experiences because I am very quickly becoming that sort of middle-aged person I didn't relate to. Um, so I have to remember that in my messaging yeah. as well. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your experience tonight, Kate. More importantly, thank you so much for um coming in on a different evening after my sort of absence delayed the talk really do appreciate it. and like i say i've never felt like i've known someone more without actually speaking to them so if that doesn't tell you about the magic of what happened over that pandemic period on social media um nothing will i think so thank you for joining me it's great to get to know you um properly no, thank you very much no brilliant <laughs> all right enjoy the rest of your evening katie and um thank, yeah, thank you. you for thank you for joining us bye-bye thank you bye